Smart contracts have limited access to information and can only see data as it exists in the present moment. Lagrange, however, unlocks a time dimension for smart contracts, allowing them to see through history. In this video, I'll explain what that means and how Lagrange works. Note, this video is made with support from Eigenlayer, but my goal here is just to explain how Lagrange works, not endorse it or Eigenlayer's investments or anything like that. So do your own research, not financial advice, etc. Every Ethereum account and smart contract lives in the Ethereum world state. And the world state is a big collection of data which sits at the center of Ethereum, so to speak. And here in my depiction of the world state, I'm showing Ethereum accounts as being these narrow rectangular sections of data, and then contracts being these larger sections with some colored squares, some colored data. And Ethereum accounts have just a little bit of information data associated with them. They have an address, which points to a nonce and balance. And then for contracts, we have address pointing to nonce balance, and then also code and storage, where the code, of course, is immutable, and the storage can change over time. And in my diagram, by the way, the uh, code for each contract is above this dotted line, and the storage is below. But each contract has its logic, whatever the contract does, obviously defined in the code, and then the storage is where it keeps track of whatever it keeps track of, and it can read and write from the storage over time. So for example, for an ERC-20 token contract, the uh, transfer function and all the stuff that the token does will be defined in the code, and then the storage will keep track of things like the uh, token name, the token symbol, the number of decimals to use when you're representing and displaying the balances, and of course the token balances themselves. So the storage will keep track of a mapping between addresses and amounts, and that will be that will represent and track all of the token holders. So the main most proximate direct data that a contract has access to is of course its own storage. But contracts can also access the storage of other contracts through calls. So this contract here is making a call out to this other contract. And that call is being interpreted by the code of this contract and it's seeing that uh, a request is being made for the value of a specific variable, let's say, which lives at some storage slot and it therefore returns that value to the call-in contract. But there are limitations to this kind of data access. Uh, contracts cannot arbitrarily access each other's data and read each other's storage. They can only access stuff that is made public with a public function, which is specifically going to fetch and return that data. So in general, most of the data in a contract storage will not be accessible to other contracts. But those are the two main ways, the two main data kind of sources that contracts have. The third way that they, or the third source of data that they have is the data that is passed in through transactions. So if you create a transaction and send it to, or invoke some function on some contract, you can send in some data, some call data there, and the contract can you know, use that data as it's executing its logic. So that's kind of how data gets from the outside world into the Ethereum realm. So when you're thinking of how oracles work, right? Like they need to get, for example, price data for some real world asset on chain. That data is going to come into the Ethereum universe through that call data. And then once data is in Ethereum, it's accessible to smart contracts, uh, either in their own storage or through these calls to other contracts reading uh, that other contract storage. So these smart contracts, these programs are pretty limited in what they can access. They can read and write their own storage and data only really enters the system through call data being sent in with through transactions or also when a contract is deployed, you can set the storage with some initial values so data can enter the system that way. But generally these contracts are pretty limited in what they can access. And even in their own storage, they can only see that storage, their own storage and the storage of other contracts, as it is at, that pr at the present moment. And what I mean by that is that if we imagine a, you know, the execution of a block of transactions, let's say we're on the fifth transaction and it's being executed and it's calling a function on this, this contract here, 
this contract is going to maybe read its own storage and maybe grab some storage from another contract, but it's only going to see the values in that storage as they are at that exact point in time after those previous four transactions and after all of the thousands of blocks that came before it, right? So its own storage and the other storage could have changed and evolved radically over that time. And maybe the previous four transactions changed it a great deal in significant ways, but it can't see any of that, right? It only sees this entire world state as it is at that exact, exact point in time when it's executing that specific transaction. And that's fine in certain ways, but it's also a big limitation because a lot of these contracts have lived and existed for a long time. And the data in their storage is very significant and important. You might have a Uniswap pair that has been, uh, that has existed for a long time. And you could, you'd like to be able to see that price data changing over time and maybe be able to read like the 30 day moving average of that pair or the 120 day moving average or see when the pair was at its highest, you know, uh, ratio or whatever, right? There's all kinds of interesting and useful things that you can do if you could see through history, but these smart contracts can only see the exact present moment. And that's, that's a bit of a limitation. So Ethereum smart contracts are limited in that they cannot see the history of this world state that they live in. The same is also true for the blockchain. Contracts cannot see the blockchain history. What they can access is only the data of the transaction which is being executed at that moment. And then also some data relating to the block, the current Ethereum block. And the data relating to the block is stuff like the base fee, uh, the gas limit, the block number, the previous Randau, random value, which can be useful. But that's just data about the current block, right? And of course they can access the current transaction data, but they can't see any of the history of the chain. So there's a lot of stuff that they cannot do because of that limitation, right? It might be nice to be able to look through the chain history and find all of the transactions uh, from some address, from some user. And maybe your contract is going to reward like DeFi uh, OG veterans. And so you wanna analyze the chain data and look for people, users, addresses who've done a bunch of interactions with certain contracts and you wanna give them some token or whatever. You can't do that, right? You can't do that with actual contract logic because they cannot see that chain history. It's entirely hidden for them. So Lagrange unlocks this capability. It allows for smart contracts to see through history, to see through time, both in terms of the world state, so they can see the world state as it changes over the years and over hundreds or thousands of blocks, and also in terms of the blockchain. So smart contracts go from being confined to the eternal present moment where they can't see really any blockchain history and they cannot see any history of the world state to now they can do these queries that scan through the entire uh, world state history and extract useful information, return that to the contract, and then the contract can execute upon that information. And same thing for the blockchain. They can now query through the entire blockchain and look for whatever they are interested in, whatever patterns and user behavior and so on, and return that to the contract and execute upon it. So this is a significant, it adds like a time dimension again to the vision of the smart contracts. So the way this works at a high level is imagine this contract here wants to query through the Ethereum world state history. What it's going to do is emit a event and the event will serve as the query. The event is going to get picked up by the Lagrange sequencer and the sequencer will then forward that event, that query to the Lagrange operators, right? And these operators are also, by the way, eigenlayer restakers. They're Ethereum validators who have opted into eigenlayer to restake their ETH. And they've opted in to serve as Lagrange operators to do work for Lagrange in exchange for some return. And therefore the work that they do is backed by that staked ETH. And I'll talk about that more in a second maybe, but this query 
is distributed among these operators so that they can in parallel execute this query. And it's important that this is being done in parallel because this Ethereum world state history is a huge amount of data and it only grows, right? It continually gets bigger. And so having a system where these queries can be uh, fulfilled in parallel is really necessary for scalability, right? So anyway, these nodes will take their portion of the query and fetch whatever data they need to fe fetch. And they will provide a proof that the data that they've pulled was in fact the correct historical data. And it's also the relevant data for the query itself, right? And they will all do that and then combine all of their query data into a final result, right? And that final result will also have a proof which proves the correctness that, you know, the result is the correct result for the entire query, that it was pulled from the true Ethereum history, etc. right? And that result will then go back through the sequencer to the contract which originally requested it. And so in that way, the contract can, can query and see through the chain history and it's this, or the world state history. But it's the same thing with the blockchain, right? Here I'm showing this contract here, <clears throat> emitting an event, making a query. And that query is likewise being uh, distributed to these operators and they're, uh, you know, in parallel, looking through the blockchain history, pulling the relevant data, providing proofs that that data is in fact correct. And then that data is being combined, squashed down to a single result, which also has a proof. And then that goes all the way back to the contract, which initially asked for the data. I mentioned that these Lagrange operators are also eigenlayer restakers. So they've, they have some ETH, which is backing some restaked ETH, which is backing their work here. And one question might be, why do we need that? Because they're providing proofs uh, as to the correctness of the results of the returning. So it would seem that you don't really need the ETH to back that because we have a proof to back it. But the ETH is backing a sort of liveness guarantee. And what that means is that we want, as we distribute out this query, we want some, some guarantee that these nodes are actually going to complete the work, right? Once they've provided the proof, it's easy to check the proof and see that the proof is valid. But if they just, there's a risk that they would just, some of them would just not respond and then the query kind of falls apart and we have to redo it, right? So what these operators do is they will sort of bind some of their restaked ETH to the fulfillment of a query, of their portion of a query, right? So they'll, and they may be able to do multiple of these at once depending on how much economic bandwidth they have. So if each query requires a half ETH uh, sort of bond, then they could, in theory, have, uh, you know, if they have 32 ETH stake, they could have 64 of these queries in flight, and they bind a little bit of ETH, half an ETH to each of these, and then if they fulfill them and provide the proof, they receive a little reward, and their ETH is freed up, it's unlocked, and now they can serve more requests. So the bandwidth is sort of set by the, the economic value that is backing these requests. The other thing I'll mention is that in order to do these queries against this world state history and blockchain history in a way that you can actually provide ZK proofs that those queries were done correctly, in order to do that, you actually have to pre-process this data into a suitable structure. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to build up this history, to basically take the uh, world state history, the blockchain history, and convert that data into a format which is amenable to these proofs. And that's something else that Lagrange does in this process, which I haven't really shown here in this diagram. Another major capability of Lagrange is that it unlocks this vision of the history of not just Ethereum, but other chains as well. So an Ethereum smart contract can actually access the world state and history and the blockchain and history of the blockchain for other EVM chains. So 
it extends the vision of these smart contracts to both the history of their own little universe and then also other little universes, other EVM systems. And finally, there's a few questions that I thought of while researching for this video that I think are interesting. One is that I'm not entirely sure whether Lagrange allows for the reading of, uh, of storage variables, which are not public, right? Because by default, like I mentioned earlier, um, a contract may expose certain variables in its storage via a public function, which can be called. And in a technical, like in a technical sense, all of the storage of a contract is it's not like it's encrypted it's not hidden it's just not directly accessible by a calling smart contract in the regular ethereum paradigm where you're doing a a call and you're waiting for the result so i'm not sure whether with lagrange it enables you to query through these sort of private variables um, i'm not sure if it does that it seems to me that it could in theory allow for that but i don't know if it does Another question is, I'm not sure how these queries are paid for, right? So if you're this contract here and you're making a query and it's going through Lagrange and it's requiring all this work and these operators are staking some, they're putting some of their restaked ETH on the line and they're doing some work, they have to be compensated, obviously. And I'm not sure how that happens because also in order for this data, the query result, to uh, get back on chain, back to the contract which requested it, that's going to require a transaction, right? Like the only way to feed data into a contract is by doing a transaction. And so there's gonna have to be some, I mean, someone has to pay for that transaction. And because it's Lagrange who is kind of waiting for this query to complete and then you know, sending it back on chain, it would seem to me that they're going to have to pay for it. So I'm just not sure exactly how the contract pays for this work to be done, because obviously the contract is the one who has to pay for it uh, somehow or other. So anyway, those are just some questions that came up while doing the research here. And um, but yeah, in summary, I think what Lagrange enables here is pretty interesting, you know, like allowing enabling the contracts to see through history and to see the whole blockchain on it seems to me that that would unlock a lot of extra things that you could do and i'm not sure entirely what those things are but it's just a huge new landscape of data and i'm sure there's a lot of valuable uh, additional functionality that could be built using this technology thanks for watching i hope that made sense uh, i have lots more videos coming i have like five that are ready to shoot um, a couple on eigenlayer topics, a couple that are not related to crypto at all, like free will and good and evil, and uh, also a big mega Ethereum explainer and lots more. So yeah, watch out for those and thanks for watching. See ya.